When I first became the director of the Institute last September, I noted to Martha Craigo that I thought there isn't a more appropriate person to open a policy institute in Alan McKechnie's name than the Right Honorable Jean Chrétien. At a colleague's urging, and I, I won't name him, but he's here today. At a colleague's urging, he suggested I write to him and ask him to come. I suggested to him in the letter that we might have about 200 people, and uh, his attendance might up that a little bit. And so when we put the notice out, within about 24 hours, 200 people had already registered. And the numbers kept growing. And when Mr. Ray informed us he was, he was happy to attend also, the numbers grew again and again and again. And so last week, when I was preparing my comments for today, and I know that we're well past 700, I thought to myself, given my original estimate of 200 people, if this is how inaccurate the Institute is going to be in terms of forecasting the future, <laughs> I don't know why anybody would take policy advice from us. We are, of course, delighted that uh, Monsieur Chrétien has joined us today and Mr. Ray. I think the high demand for the, the seats is a testimony to our speakers, um, also to the legacy of Alan J. McKechn and the appetite for rigorous policy debate and discussion in our community. I extend my gratitude to everyone, the panelists, the guests, uh, the distinguished members of our advisory board, and indeed the members of the original trust who've been enormously supportive of we, as we've made the, the transition to Dalhousie. I'd also like to thank uh, Gerald Butts, the uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's principal secretary, who really wanted to be here today and was unfortunately unable to, to make it, but he's very committed to the Institute and I look forward to welcome, welcoming him one day soon. In 1997, McKechn wrote, the formula for success and longevity in politics involves a relationship with electors based on mutual trust and on a responsiveness which, for the local community, guarantees that their views be heard and factored into policy formulation. The McKechn Institute for Public Policy and Governance at Dalhousie will be led by the spirit of McKechn's words. We will work to establish trust in the community as a reliable source for policy advice. As a host and platform for honest policy debate, our concerns will be local and national. We invited a diverse group today. The audience is made up of people from all political parties, from the private not-for-profit sector. There are public servants from all orders of government. There are also several students here who, of course, are the next generation of policymakers, and they're key to our success. We want to engage with all these constituencies. We also want to make our research available, accessible, and applicable. We, we will discuss our research themes in more detail during our panel. Um, but we really want to engage with our community as we move forward. So on that, I'll just say thank you very much for coming. Looking forward to a great exchange, and we're really glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Quigley. And now we're going to start the day off with a panel discussion that touches, as, as uh, Dr. Quigley said, on some of the themes that the Institute will be addressing in their work. And um, as he said, one member of our panel wasn't able to make it today, and that was Gerald Butts. His duties in cabinet prevented him from coming. Uh, but happily enough, uh, uh, Mr. Andy Fillmore, the member of parliament for Halifax, has very kindly agreed to take his place. So let me introduce to you then the members of this panel, and I'll start with Andy Fillmore. He's an urban planner, an urban designer by profession, uh, Mr. Fillmore has been a community builder and a leader in the private, public, and academic sectors. And I want to mention that he's a Dalhousie grad and he's also taught at this university, so we're very happy to welcome him back to his campus. The next me member of the panel is Dr. Pamela Palmatter, the Chair in Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University in Toronto. Dr. Paul Matter is a Mi'kmaq citizen and a member of the Eel River Bar First Nation in northern New Brunswick. She's been a lawyer for 18 years and a dedicated social justice activist. She's authored several books, including her latest one, which is entitled Indigenous Nationhood, Empowering Grassroots Citizens. 
She is also a member of the McKechn Institute's Advisory Board. Next, Kim Brooks is an associate professor in the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University. Professor Brooks has just completed a, a five-year mandate as Dean of the Faculty of Law, and she was one of the sponsoring deans for, that helped to attract the McKechn Institute to Dalhousie. She's previously let, held the H. Howard Stewart Steichman Chair in Law of Taxation in the Faculty of Law at McGill University and has practiced as a tax lawyer with Steichman and Elliott in the Toronto and London UK offices. And finally, we have David Morgan, who is a PhD candidate in political science at Dalhousie. Mr. Morgan is a doctoral fellow with Dalhousie's Center for Foreign Policy Studies. He's funded by a Trudeau scholarship and a Vanier Canada graduate scholarship. His research spans a wide range of interests, including humanitarian action, international development, and resilience. So now, if you'll all come up and take your places, Kevin will moderate the panel for us. Thanks, Martha. And welcome to our, uh, our very distinguished panelists. We're really grateful that you're here for this special occasion. The, um, the format of the panel will be, will be this. We've, uh, unfortunately, we're going to keep them on a, a tight uh, timeline, so they're going to have to be uh, short, sharp, and focused. Um, we, have, uh, we will ask one question uh, for two people, so each of them will have an opportunity to answer, two of the people will have an opportunity to answer the question, and so we can compare answers, of course. And uh, they will each have three minutes to answer those questions. And these are big questions, so it's probably cruel and unusual treatment, and many of them have already made that point to me. So we'll have to be forgiving, I think, that uh, they're going to have to get to the points uh, in a short, sharp way. Um, so on that note, I'm going to uh, start with my first question, and I'm going to just point out, to pick up on what Martha said, that the, these are themes that, uh, the questions that come out of, I think, some important policy discussions we're having right now. They also emerge from some of the key themes that we're going to be pursuing uh, over the next little while at the Institute. I thought it would be a good place to start. One of our themes is civic engagement, and I thought I, I might ask a question about uh, some of the challenges political parties are having today. This question will be for, uh, for Andy Fillmore and for, for Pam Palmiter. Um, for those of you who were at the IPAC conference last year, the Institute of Public Administration Canada, we had a fabulous uh, panel, um, and it was uh, attended by Peter Wallace, who's uh, former Secretary of the Cabinet, now a city manager for Toronto, uh, Brent Rathjeber, uh, uh, a former MP, and Graham Steele, former Minister of Finance. And I want to quote, uh, it was a, a panel on uh, the democratic deficit. I want to quote what um, Graham Steele said, uh, a couple of paragraphs of what he said, uh, about the problem with political parties today and maybe the changing dynamic of the policy process. And I'd like um, to ask Andy and Pam to offer some, some thoughts on that. And I would say that while Graham made this point, there seemed to be a consensus on the panel that, that he was on to something. So this is what uh, Graham said. I could never figure out why someone should join a political party. I know what actually happens. The parties want you for two things. They want you for your money, and they want you to go out and campaign. Because in Canada, campaigns are still labor intensive. The last thing the party wants the membership to do is get involved in the policy making, the platform development, because that's something that's reserved strictly for professionals. But they're not professional policy people like the people in this room, they're professional marketers. And so for the platforms becoming marketing documents where you're trying to sell something to your audience. So for all those reasons, I could for the life of me not think of a good idea of why someone should join a political party. But that doesn't mean that politics doesn't matter. That's a totally different thing. And what I see, and not just with young people, but with a lot of people, is they're getting involved in policy issues, but in organizations other than political parties. Because in politics, policy matters as much as it ever did. So my question for uh, Andy and Pam, do you share Graham Steele's concern about the functioning of political parties? 
and if you were advising a young person today about how to have impact in the policy process, what would you tell them? Andy. Thank you, uh, Kevin, for that. Uh, well, I'd like to start by just uh, addressing the broader theme of engagement, and uh, something that I learned a long time ago in my career is that people uh, need and deserve to be fundamentally involved in the decisions that impact their lives, and any of the successes that, uh, that I've had in my career as a planner uh, have had uh, engagement fundamentally rooted in them. People need to be able to see their aspirations and, and themselves in, in whatever the project might be. And I think that to turn that, uh, that lens to politics, I think that holds absolutely true here as well. Um, I think there are really two major functions of political parties. And the first is uh, they offer voters, citizens, a, a choice, a, a sort of an organized presentation of a philosophy or of a way uh, of governing. What's important? Uh, what's uh, what's going to be um, what's going to be leading the agenda, and that would be very hard to find uh, without an organized structure. It al it allows the structure allows people to evaluate the leader, the platform, the local candidate in a very kind of coherent way, which is really important. And the other way, of course, that, that parties are important is that uh, are in opposition. Um, we opposition parties have a very important job of holding government accountable, and uh, again, to have a credible and coherent and legible structure uh, for that opposition is extremely helpful to people. Um, I would say also that right now in the, um, the Liberal Party, we're working toward a new party constitution, one that uh, focuses much more heavily on involving uh, Canadian citizens in policy development uh, in a very kind of open and transparent way, much more so than in the past. And, and one of the things that, uh, that we'll do to, to help that to, to happen is to eliminate the, the whole concept of a, of a membership fee. Uh, so that's going to make uh, a very porous uh, interface there. And then the, the last piece about youth, I'll, um, I'll answer that with, with what I tell uh, youth who ask me this question all the time. Uh, my, you know, how do I get involved? And the answer is just you know, show up, be present, volunteer, uh, attend meetings, make your voice heard, and, and use your voice and your actions to, to build the world that you want to live in. Um, uh, my own campaign was the most youthful campaign team in uh, Atlanta, Canada, and one of the most youthful in the country. And uh, a big part of that was this ethos about involvement. Um, so the, the very core of my campaign team was largely university students who were given tremendous uh, authority and responsibility to, to prosecute the, the campaign, and they did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. It's an honor to be back on sovereign, unceded Mi'kmaq territory and participating in this conference. Um, I, I share some of the concerns around political parties, and I think a large number of youth and First Nations people do as well. Um, what we see in the media is not always what we would like to be reflected in our own communities when it comes to political parties and, and the divisions and the things that happen. But that doesn't mean that we have to be disengaged. I think that there's a common misconception of, around what it means to be engaged uh, in any kind of democracy or government. And if the only thing you do is vote, then you are disengaged. I purposely don't vote, but I am the most engaged person because there's more ways to be engaged in, in your formal government, uh, in indigenous governments, and in the real government, which is the people on the ground. That, that's the real government. That's where all the power comes from. And so I think in terms of, of being engaged, we don't have to focus so much on political parties, where you belong, where you don't belong, or even how you're going to vote. It's what are you doing to be informed and mobilizing and, and putting pressure and working with non-government organizations and human rights organizations and, and educating and empowering other people. Some of the people that were the most engaged in the last election didn't vote, but they helped mobilize other people. They helped educate and inform other people. And I think we have to look at government very differently and stop looking at the people in parliament as the ones who are going to, to solve all the problems and look at the real government on the ground in our capacity and knowledge. And I think that's what this institute has the capacity to do, to look beyond where we've always looked for solutions and, and look at the people on the ground, the government on the ground on, in terms of, of how we go forward. And, and part of that is really embracing our intergovernmental relations. 
This isn't just about provinces and, and the federal government. It's also about Indigenous governments and how we can work together on all of these issues moving forward. So that's, that's where I would head. Thank you. I've got a question for Kim Brooks and David Morgan now, and this falls under the theme of Atlantic Canada and the world. And if you're wondering, uh, yes, I said Atlantic Canada and the world. So you, you have to be affected by this because you're either in Atlantic Canada or you're in the world. <laughs> this theme emerged really from trying to think about what is the Atlantic Canadian position on important policy issues. So we wanted, uh, of course, to situate it within a Canadian context, but we also wanted to understand uh, deeply, particularly engaging with the, the legacy of Alan J. McKechn, to think about what is the Atlantic Canadian position. And of course, as we move forward, we want to develop uh, an expertise in, in important policy areas. We want to be a source of reliable policy information on issues that are specific to Atlantic Canada or issues really just that are of national or international concern with an Atlantic Canadian focus or perspective. We want to be able to put that forward. So we think the Atlantic Canada and the world theme is really important. Uh, and we'll be developing that theme uh, in earnest with a lot of the work that we do. I'll also be touching on uh, some aspects of healthcare, and we will, healthcare governance is another theme that we'll be developing at the Institute. So, um, this question, uh, I'm going to draw on uh, the words of uh, the Honorable Alan J. McKechn himself. Um, he wrote this after he had decided he wasn't going to run for a seat in Parliament anymore, and he had an interaction with somebody at a store. So I want, to, I want to quote from uh, Mr. McKechn. As I stood around in the cooperative store in Marguerite Forks, a constituent who made his living on the land and in the forest said to me, I hear you're not running again. You certainly kept bread on the table here in the north all of those years. As a compliment, it was enormous, McKechn writes. As a summation of one's political career from a citizen who made a living the hard way, it was heartwarming. His appraisal at the end of my service in the House of Commons took me back to its beginnings and why keeping bread on the table in the widest interpretation of that expression was the principal reason I left a university teaching post to enter politics. So in my own research uh, about Alan J. McKechn, nothing stands out more than uh, his commitment to alleviate the difficult uh, conditions of the poor and socio uh, socioeconomically uh, disadvantaged. We see this in his maiden speech in the House of Commons in 1954 about employment policy, as well as his ministerial work that led to the Canada Labor Standards Code in 1965, Canada Assistance Plan in 1966, the Medical Care Act in 1966, and his work on international development. So now I'd like to fast forward to 2016 and focus our attention on the Syrian refugee issue. The Atlantic region has a demographics challenge. Low birth rates, an aging population, outward migration, we need people, I think there's a, a consensus on that point. There are also arguably ethical obligations to hard-pressed, war-torn regions. Yet polling data in Atlantic Canada suggests people have mixed feelings about Syrian refugees coming to Canada. In practice, there are also a number of challenges, including language, education, health, and cultural integration issues. Many have arrived poor and will have significant economic challenges for some time. My question to Kim and David, from your experience, what does a Syrian refugee experience add to our understanding about the road ahead for the Atlantic region, thinking in particular about ethical obligations abroad and prosperity at home, or in Mr. McKechn's words, keeping bread on the table in the widest possible sense? Kim. So let me just acknowledge Minister Diab's work in this area um, and say, as the introduction revealed, I'm a tax person. And what I've learned is that I know a small amount about tax and basically nothing about anything else, which means <laughs> you have to rely on the smart people around you. And so I understand that Constance McIntosh and Howard Remus are in the audience, and please <clears throat> ask them what my view is on this matter. <laughs> so we're a region that thrives mostly privately on identifying and making other those who come from away. This propensity sits uneasily against our sense that so many of us, although certainly not all of us, landed in the Atlantic region at some point as CFAs, and that many of us will leave becoming both from here and yet not from here. This seems as real as ever as we witness and live the reality of Fort Mac and the seemingly inevitable footpath from there to here and then back. 
Against this background, it's hard to know what will come of the Syrian refugees who have made their way to Atlantic Canada and to the challenges migration will continue to present to our understanding of our ethical obligations and to the notion of keeping bread on the table. I imagine that the arrival of migrants has always presented us with the possibility of change, a possibility hinted to in the Ivany report, particularly in its calls around how additional immigration might assist us to embrace entrepreneurship. I try to imagine the translation work we are asking Syrian refugees to do as they arrive in Atlantic Canada. They might have dreamed of jobs, security, love, and community. And they might find themselves without familiar communities with ill-fitted literacy skills and without critical financial, psychosocial, and other supports. Newspaper stories are filled with updates about housing and schooling and about the provision of household items and medical and dental care. The public dialogue seems preoccupied with numbers and timing, when will the promised refugees arrive? And the policy discourse is dominated by debates about economic returns. Will we pay more for these arrivals than they will contribute? The advantages of government versus private sponsorship and whether refugees or immigrants more generally will solve pressures presented by declining populations. At Dalhousie, we are rich with thoughtful people who can add much to those debates, including my fellow panelist, David Morgan, whose work looks, among other things, at children and security in the Syrian context, and Dr. Martha Crego, who has spent countless hours bringing together a Syrian refugee science coalition. I hope that the Syrian refugees present us with something else, too. I hope they remind us of our ethical obligation to stay open-minded that we might move closer to a cosmopolitanism that asks less about whether we should donate winter clothing, although of course we should, and more about what it might mean to see ourselves as part of a larger migrant and migrating world, not just migrating people, but also the migration of ideas and ways of being, that we might see ourselves a little more transitionally as Atlantic Canadians. Alan McKechn changed who we were as Canadians when he was willing to see poor people and to contemplate a Canada that would actively change to ensure inclusion. Labor standards, social assistance, and Medicare legislation responded to and then altered who we were in ways that would have been unimaginable in the decades before him. I hope that the arrival of the Syrian refugees to Canada and to the Atlantic region in particular invites us to wonder who we might be together and how we might change the world around us with a vision of that magnitude in this era. Thank you, Kevin. David. Uh, well, so I just want to start by thanking Kevin and thanking Dr. Crago for the opportunity to be on this panel. Um, so I'll pick up with the last part of Kevin's question, which referred to kind of the ethical obligations abroad and prosperity at home. And I think in, this, in the case of Syrian refugees, I think these are mutually compatible goals. Um, so when I was reflecting back on this issue, I was also thinking about the Ivany report, um, which, as I'm sure many of you know, presented a fairly grim, in some sense, <laughs> Um, but also a very honest account of many of the challenges that are facing Nova Scotia and also Atlantic Canada as a whole. And what it argued is that we're really on the verge of, we're potentially on the verge of significant decline um, as we have an aging and shrinking population and we're facing low economic growth. And what it argued for was not just a shift in policy, uh, but a shift in culture and attitude as well to kind of to challenge the, the rural and urban divide uh, to counter negative attitudes towards new immigrants and those that come from away. Um, and really to kind of challenge this prevailing resistance to change. And what it recommended was a Projet National, uh, a, provin a, a project based on provincial solidarity and a shared vision for the future. In order that, in order that we can become the progressive and change-oriented society um, that we want to become. And maybe it's too soon to make this argument, but I, I can see that um, maybe we're entering the first stages of this project uh, with the Syrian refugee experience. Um, across, for the past few months, I mean, we've seen an outpouring of goodwill and community spirit as communities have welcomed Syrian refugees. Um, the refugees the Refugee Donation Center here in Halifax actually closed its doors to donations after a few weeks, as uh, something like 5,000 people came out to make donations. Um, across the province and across the region, we've seen individual and community initiatives that transcend the urban and rural divide. And I mean, there have been, sure, there have been challenges. There's been strains on our schools. There's the challenges of finding appropriate housing. 
Uh, there's been growing demands on our food banks. But I think what's really stood out for me anyway is the, is the collective effort and the fact that people have really rallied around this issue. What I think we need now is more of a province-wide and maybe even a region-wide conversation about how to create a coherent, comprehensive, compassionate program that not only brings in refugees, but ensures that they're adequately supported now that they're here. Um, so we need sustainable policies and programs that are focused on helping them find jobs, on building connections within their communities, and really feeling welcome to the province, to the region, and to Canada. And really, I mean, making sure that they're keeping bread on the table, as Kevin referred to. And I mean, this really could become part of a larger program focused on immigration that could help inject new energy and entrepreneurial dri drive into the region. And this, of course, I mean, this, I think, will comes back to what you mentioned at the beginning. This, I think, will really contribute to our long-term prosperity while also fulfilling our ethical obligations abroad. All right, thank you. Okay, we're going to shift themes now. We're going to talk a little bit about smart infrastructure, which is also a theme of the, uh, of the institutes. Um, of course, there's been a lot of talk about infrastructure investments, and the, many of them can be transformative, and they take a long time to plan and to implement. So I'd like to pick up on this theme. This is a question for, uh, for Andy and for David on smart infrastructure. The 2015 Canadian Infrastructure Report card concluded that one-third of Canadian infrastructure in water and transportation is in fair, poor, or very poor shape. There are many practical and political pressures that converge to force immediate needs to the fore. At the same time, big idea infrastructure investments can be transformational. They help us not just to address future needs in terms of climate change and security, but they also help to shape the future. They allow us to shape the future in terms of exploiting the opportunities of new trade deals. They can help us to build the cities we want to live in. So my question for Andy and David, how do we strike a balance between the short-term needs in infrastructure investments and the longer-term visionary infrastructure investments? In other words, the fixing the plumbing versus the transformative stuff. Andy. Well, thanks for that. Um, I think we can do both, but I'll, I'll start by first acknowledging that there is a, in North America wide, there is a tremendous uh, challenge with um, deferred maintenance on infrastructure. Um, the, uh, there are some very visible examples of that. The Jack Cartier Bridge in Montreal, of course, is a, is a sort of a poster child for this problem. But most of it is, frankly, uh, invisible. It's under the ground in most cases and hard to see, but absolutely critical to the, to the healthy and uh, productive functioning of our communities. Um, last year, the Atlantic Provinces Economic Council said that uh, in How downtown Halifax alone, there is something like a $700 million infrastructure deficit just for transit, pipe services, and uh, streetscapes, which is, which is phenomenal. And I know a lot of people are working hard to, to amend that, and I, I would never put words into the, into the uh, mouth of, a, of Mayor Savage, but I, I'm quite sure that high on the list of uh, his priorities when speaking with the federal government about infrastructure are pipe services. Um, very, very critical to, to, for the communities to succeed. Um, I, uh, I'll sound like a planner for a moment here, uh, um, but I, like I said, North America wide, we really are looking at a, a kind of a ticking time bomb of financial liability. A lot of these uh, big infrastructure systems, be they uh, the power grid, uh, pipe services, uh, highways, transit, are nearing the end of their design life and uh, will need to be recapitalized very soon and a lot of them all at once. Um, and that's in addition to the ongoing deferred maintenance challenge. So this is, uh, this is something, this is a real problem and you can see that, um, that uh, government is responding to that with this historic infrastructure spend. Um, but, we ha but we also have to keep in mind the, uh, the longer term arc of not just of our communities, but of, of our country and of our planet. And we really do need to be doing better for, uh, for the environment. And to that end, uh, keeping in mind the environmental impact of, uh, of infrastructure projects as we go is, uh, is incredibly important. There, it's very possible that there are short-term projects that we would do right away that seem incredibly important, but in the long term are actually uh, creating much higher costs for us and much greater problems down the road. So uh, spending, uh, making uh, investments intelligently and intentionally now uh, for the long term is really important. 
and uh, if, I just, if I have another minute, um, I was able last week to uh, introduce my own private member's motion in the House of Commons, which, which um, uh, motion M45, which simply put says that uh, when any applic application for federal infrastructure funding comes in, it must be accompanied with a greenhouse gas uh, analysis. And in this way, we can, and, and then where appropriate, prioritize those that help us reach our goals. And in this way, government uh, can account for the carbon that we're buying, and we can keep track about how we're doing against those very important uh, uh, goals, those international commitments that we've made to reduce, to re reduce carbon overall. So just to finish then, the point is we can do both. We, I think with every single decision we make, in spending and investing taxpayer money, we have an opportunity to mitigate against climate change and reduce carbon in the atmosphere. And we can do that with small projects and big projects, short term and long term. Great, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> David. I mean, yeah, so it's, it's a tricky question. How do you balance the short term needs versus the long term investments? Um, so at the moment, I actually I live outside of Halifax and I'm not too far from Pictou County. And for those of you know, I mean, Pictou County has kind of that infa infamous reputation as having some of the worst roads in Atlantic Canada, maybe <laughs> in the country. And so, I mean, those kind of short-term needs are pretty hard to ignore. I mean, these are pressing needs that need to be addressed. But at the same time, I think we do need to plan for the future, and we do need to be able to do both things. Um, specifically, I think we need, to do, we need to plan for a future of climate change and climate risk. And this is really one of the biggest challenges today in terms of our infrastructure. Um, so as Kevin mentioned, I mean, we are facing a huge municipal infrastructure deficit somewhere in the ballpark of $200 billion. Um, it's aging, it's in need of reinvestment, and it is rightly a priority area, area of the current government. But at the same time, climate change has the potential to affect the lifespan of our existing infrastructure. Uh, so I saw one estimate that by 2020, uh, so just four years from now, Climate change could be affecting our infrastructure by as much as five billion a year, and by 2050, that number could be as high as 40 billion a year. And so it's kind of obvious that the investments that we make today need to be resilient to the future impacts and the current impacts of climate change. Obviously, cost is one of the biggest barriers in this regard, um, and especially when the benefits aren't immediately obvious, obvious, you might not see them within a few years, you definitely won't see them within an election cycle. But I think we need to kind of flip this cycle around. We need to recognize that there are opportunities that are involved and that, that with smart, targeted investments, um, we can improve health, we can boost productivity, uh, we can encourage economic activity, all while we're moving towards a lower carbon economy. And many of these investments can be made now as we upgrade our roads and our transit systems. So I think what we need is uh, more collaboration across governments, um, also within our communities. Um, so a colleague of mine um, works on this really interesting pro uh, project called Enabling Cities, which looks at ways to creatively engage citizens in tackling complex issues that they're facing within their own communities. So it doesn't just need to be at the level of government, it can happen at the citizen level as well. Um, we also need the right incentives to encourage adaptation activities, and we also need to gain greater public buy-in. I mean, everyone understands the the importance of climate change. We all re realize that this is a risk that's coming, but we also need that buy-in now. We need a bigger conversation about, you know, what are the challenges that we're facing? What are the investments that we need? And how can we start moving towards this um, in, the, in the near future? Thank you. Thank you, Dave. So we have one last question, and this uh, falls under, we go back to our civic engagement theme, and um, I'm gonna ask uh, Kim and Pam to take a shot at this one. I'll just point out that, that uh, Kim Brooks was instrumental in uh, uh, shepherding the uh, application forward at Dalhousie to secure the Public Policy Institute, the McKechnie Public Policy Institute at Dalhousie. So I wanna, I wanna thank her for that, and, and that's why I'm gonna put her on the hot seat for this particular question about <laughs> what on earth should we be doing. Um, in September 1968, uh, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau used the occasion of his first speech from the throne to call for the creation of an independent policy institute in Canada, largely because according to the scholar Everett Lindquist, there was almost no interdisciplinary or policy research occurring in the country at the time. Today, think tanks take a number of shapes and sizes and pursue different strategies. Some are loud and attention-seeking, some are quiet, 
Some are research intensive, some have strong advocacy functions, some spend, uh, spend as much money communicating research as they do conducting research. Some are national and international, others are deliberately local. Most claim to be nonpartisan, but there's often a strong ideological bent. So my question for Kim and Pam, how best can a policy institute based at Dalhousie have impact locally and nationally? And if we were to reconvene in three years, how would we know we were off to a good start? So thanks. Um, the McKegan Institute has identified these four themes that will guide its work, which have been the subject of today's discussion, civic engagement, Atlantic Canada and the world, redesigning health systems and safe, green and smart infrastructure. The effort to identify key themes should ensure that the Institute does not inadvertently spread itself too thin, which is a major risk in a world with so many fascinating public policy issues. The Institute should, of course, set itself some outcome-oriented goals for its first three years, because who doesn't love to count <laughs> and make lists? <laughs> it should engage some large number of graduate students and policymakers, should publish some large number of policy papers, should build a network of researchers and policymakers working on each of the four themes, should host some number of, of workshops and conferences and so on. All of those goals, I think, are relatively easy to identify and with some elbow grease are relatively easy to accomplish. But part of the success of the Institute should be measured against what makes universities unique. Universities maintain the space of the imagination. In other words, in the press of life with its myriad demands, think particularly in this instance of the press of public service and of the urgent and immediate calls for action by government on all manner of issues, those of us who are university academics have a unique obligation and a distinct context that enables deliberative space to dream about what is possible. To that end, I think the Institute would be off to a successful start if it is able to connect those with the time to imagine and those with an obligation to develop and implement sound public policy, whether regionally, nationally, or internationally. The outcome would be more dreaming. Put another way, the Institute should enable movement and even the realization of big ideas or big projects. I think the time is right for a new era of progressive policies, whether around a redefined relationship with Aboriginal peoples, guaranteed income, renewable energy, or transportation infrastructure. These are the kinds of transformative projects that characterized Alan McKechn's contribution to public life, and the Institute will have been successful if three years from now we find ourselves looking at one or more of the identified themes and saying, who could have imagined that was possible three years ago? And of course, our answer would be us. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I agree with what you said, Kim, and I, and I think just to add to that, um, I think if we have an opportunity right now, a, a real opportunity to do things different. We can be like Star Trek and boldly go <laughs> where other policy institutes refuse to go. We can be brave enough to shine light on all the things that aren't working, all of the things that we need to fix, instead of just the usual status quo of let's look at this economic policy, let's look at this protocol, things that have been looked at and reviewed and researched a thousand times. Let's be brave. Let's engage with people outside of government. Let's engage with non-government organizations. Let's engage with international experts. Let's engage with the people on the ground with the Inuit in the north who can tell you first and foremost what happens when climate change uh, is coming versus the people who talk about the theories around it. I mean, we, we don't have to be carbon copies of every other institution. We, we shouldn't be a policy institute for hire. Oh, I have a piece of legislation I want to introduce. Can you please write a policy paper on why this is the best way to go? Start thinking about policy innovation and new ideas for all of our collective well-being, not a liberal one, not a conservative one, and not an NDP one, one that cuts across all of our interests. And, and even looking at indigenous issues differently, the fact that everything that is impacting us will impact Canadians. The fact that indigenous peoples are Canadians' last best hope at protecting the environment and looking at sustainable growth. We can change that policy discussion and informed evidence-based decision-making based on all the evidence. So not just human health, but environmental health and water health and plant and animal health that impact human health. 
not just the costs of infrastructure and development, but what are all of the environmental costs? What are all of the human costs? What about not just the economy, but sustainability? Nothing can grow forever. I mean, the, the laws of science will tell you that. There's not in never-ending growth. So we, as a policy institute, have really a historic opportunity to be truly nonpartisan, truly non-government-based, truly uh, independent. And by, uh, by bringing together all of the diverse people that so far are involved in it with very different views and ideas, we can take policy making to a new level. So it's not a policy director in a government office, but it's everybody here, it's all of the researchers, and it's the people on the ground who will have, who will have a say and who are impacted. And I think, I think we have the opportunity to do that. I was tempted to almost give Pam an extra minute there, Martha. Um, <laughs> that's, that's great. We're gonna, we, we need that for the advertising brochure. But thank you very much to uh, the panelists. Uh, but I'll, I'll hand it to Martha, I think, to do the thing. Well, it feels